Uh, all right, so everyone, uh, welcome once again, and thank you for joining in at this uh, fine hour uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, okay, so welcome to the joint effort of Serbian product community and Scrum Wednesdays meetup. Uh, today we are pleased to host Jenny Herald with an interesting topic, as you can see by our numbers here. Uh, Jenny is a VP of Product Evangelism of GTM Hub, where she champions the company's effort to help customers orchestrate results at scale. The way she is doing this is uh, via world's most powerful OKRs platform. Uh, also, she's the host of Dreams with Deadlines podcast, and she has spent more than nine years accelerating growth of, uh, for enterprises such as Microsoft and Moodleist. Uh, and also she is a big plant lover so big welcome to jenny <laughs> thanks i appreciate that yeah so uh the way we figured of doing our meetup today is to have a short presentation of some uh, key stuff about okrs and then uh, we will we were hoping for a really interactive part so feel free to post your questions during the during the presentation and we circle, circle back to them or just uh, you can, after the presentation, you can uh, put your hand up and ask uh, whatever you seem interested in and uh, Jenny will find the best way to answer. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Jenny, is there anything else you wanna, you wanna uh, no, no, mention before we start? Oh, it was just a pleasure to meet you all. I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. So thank you in advance for the invite. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. All right. So the story of OKRs is what you all came here to listen to today, or at least talk about. So we'll do that. Um, I feel like when people start going, getting into OKRs, it's, it's like this, you get an OKR and you get an OKR. We all get OKRs. And it gets a bit messy. Um, so let's, let's discuss and let's back it up. Like, where did this all come from? Uh, so this is not new, actually. It's a methodology that is older than some of the methodologies you probably even heard about. We'll start with Peter Drucker, who's considered like kind of a, the person who defined management or the idea of management. And he came up with management by objectives in the 1950s. And then Andy Grove, who was the CEO of Intel, uh, started to realize that his business was probably going to get commoditized. You probably read this if you read Measure It Matters. Uh, and he needed to pivot Intel's business into what it is today. So he devised a scheme to kind of advance or evolve MBOs into what we know of as objectives and key results. John Doerr, he was made famous, famous uh, Kleiner Perkins. He worked for Andy Grove around 1975. Uh, he learns about this methodology. Eventually he came to be a really rich dude and he was advising uh, Google, the founders of Google on, you know, you can really grow and scale a business using this methodology. Here's how you do it. So in 2000, Google starts using them. Today, businesses all over the world are using them. And the future of the application of using the methodology is continuing to grow. Actually, and John Doerr now wrote a, a really uh, good and compelling piece on how the world can be saved using OKRs to fight climate crisis. So if you've heard of speed and scale, that's kind of what he's talking about in that, in that book. So what are these things, right? objectives and key results is what the acronym stands for, but basically it's a goal setting methodology. All kinds of people, all kinds of businesses, and even individuals can use them. And it helps to be able to frame more ambitious goals and track for those results over time. The really, really big picture though, and this is what differentiates it from, let's say all of the other methodologies is it's really a strategy execution idea. Like the business has a place it needs to go, or you as a team has an idea or a department, maybe product has a strategy. How do you actually make that strategy real? We would suggest OKRs are a means to do that. But what aren't they, right? People conflate the idea of OKRs and other things and it gets them into trouble. You really shouldn't include everything. Sometimes businesses are like, oh, we gotta start measuring everything with OKRs. So you just don't do that. Or, you know, this is like our business as usual stuff. You know, like we have to do monthly closeout as a finance team or, other activities that might be business as usual, don't do that. And some teams decide, oh, we're going to track all of our tasks in here and duplicate our project, project management using OKRs. This is like the worst of all sins. Don't do that. 
because that's not what it's used for. It really is about being able to advance or grow whatever it is that you're trying to advance or grow. So then how do you frame an, an objective and key result? We would suggest, and this is coming from John Doerr, and we have seen an evolution to add to it, that we as a team will do this thing, this objective, this idea of where we want to be as measured by a set of key results, which are quantitative in nature. So measures that tell us that we're successful in reaching that qualitative objective. So that fill in the blank reason, like what is your why? So in a nutshell, if you looked at it and you're familiar with Simon Sinek's work, he would say, start with your why. Like, why are you doing this? What do you got to go do it with about it? And then how are you going to go get there? And it's a good frame to think about it. So who uses it? So we already know that Google uses it. Atlassian, they have playbooks about this stuff. Intel, obviously, because that's where Andy Grove came from. If you're familiar with the navigation software, they're a customer of ours, actually TomTom. Tom. Spotify, I use it. Microsoft, I used to work there. They definitely use it. Nike, so if you wear those shoes and you're like, wait, how are they advancing the story? They're using OKR, especially on the tech teams, Societe Generale, so they're a bank. Red Hat, if you're familiar with that sort of those folks, and since I think I'm hopefully talking to some product engineering peeps, GitHub. GitHub definitely uses OKR. So I have to listen to my partner talk about how uh, they have to go set them. So very familiar with their process as well. Uh, so then let's see, why should you use them? Like, great, Jenny, you talked about, you start with why. Well, if you're having struggle with like, what should we focus on? Or like, we're all over the place and you need to align or does someone actually working on this and moving it forward, accountability? Wait, what's actually happening here? Transparency. And really, I think this is kind of what attracted me to work in this space is really engaging. Like we do a lot of good work and sometimes it's very difficult to understand how what we're doing actually has any kind of impact to our team, department, business, peers. I would say it's a good mechanism to really get that sense of fulfillment and purpose and what you, what it is that you're doing, whether you're shipping product, designing product, uh, selling or marketing products, everyone can align around that. So then what are things, and you've heard me mention what OKRs are not, we'll kind of lay into that a little bit more. Like what are some things you should avoid? Well, just like if you were setting uh, New Year's resolutions, don't just say that you're gonna go do it and then forget that you said, I'm gonna lose weight. Like you have to actually keep up with it. So review them regularly. Some issues that teams have is like, oh, our C-level or our department head came down and said, we shall do OKRs, but they don't explain why. And so now everybody is supposed to do a bunch of stuff that they don't understand why they should do it. So focus on the benefits to the organization and teams. If it's, look, we, have, we need to pivot the business. And as a result, we're going to use OKRs to help us get through that change. Great. If it's, we're slowing our shipping and we don't know if we're actually delivering meaningful value to the customers anymore and we're being challenged in the market. We're gonna use OKRs to get more innovative. Great, whatever it is, say why. Uh, another thing is, okay, so you provide a context. People get it, they probably agree with you, but there's no training. Um, and you just can have a bunch of people who are frustrated because yeah. They know what they're expected of them, but they don't know how to do it. That's not good. So educate. Having too many of these, like this, this shouldn't be, again, covering everything. Less is more. If you want to really focus your organization and that's something that you need to, to do as a business leader or as a team leader or whatever, great. Then really focus a team, pick one, maybe two, maximum three OKRs. Um, focusing on outputs. So this is really project and task orientation, like if you're using this as a, when did we ship it or when are we expected to ship it thing, that's not gonna work. So you really should prioritize the outcomes you expect to deliver for the customer or the behavior change you should expect as a result of having set that OKR. And then the last, and this is, this is a shame, right? Let's say you do all that, but at the end of the period, you've done a bunch of really great work. You're seeing the outcomes that you expect, but you're not learning or you didn't get those outcomes, but you're not learning. That's like the worst. So hold rest retrospectives. I'm talking to PMs out there, engineers out there and design folks and probably researchers maybe. 
you, you probably do this as part of your scrum practice. I think it happens with uh, OKRs as well. So continuously think about how you're improving and what you're going to try next. Use it as an experiment to filter your backlog. And with that, I think we're going to go on to your questions because presumably you have them. Um, so let's discuss that. OK, so chat so far is empty. But uh, until people figure out a question or two, uh, you mentioned Scrum. So I would uh, like have you do you have experience with scrum teams or do you have some experience with implementing uh, okrs in uh, scrum organizations or agile organization how does that fit in or doesn't fit in what are the challenges and benefits i'm asking here in front of of course scrum wednesday guys because that's our niche so uh that seems like a you know, like important topic for me yeah, the answer is yes, I do have experience with this. Um, I've run product teams myself, uh, some flavor of Kanban, some flavors of Scrum. Like, how does this fit? Well, I mean, here's the thing, right? At the end of the day, we have backlogs and we're like, oh, yeah, let's just add it to the backlog. It'll be fine. And then your backlog goes from like, here are the five things we want to do. And then the end of the year, like, here are the 70 things we didn't get to go do. And it just keeps growing and everyone starts freaking out about it. Well, I mean, OKRs really provide the lens on, we need, we have this product strategy. Let's say you're Netflix. And I, I actually interviewed the dude at Netflix who was the VP that took it from DVD to home to what it is today, content creation. The way he thought about it is kind of how I thought about it too. Like, what are you trying to do? For them, it was their, their number one strategy was to get DVDs to home. Cool, we're gonna go do that. Then when you look at your backlog and you're thinking through, oh, like is the stuff that we're doing actually improving our experience to get people to get DVDs to home? What are different ways we can get them to do that? And then they had to advance their strategy and evolve it. They're like, okay, now people are doing it from home, but how do we get people to actually consume online content? Uh, and so they had to think through how they were gonna measure outcomes and the behavior change. And so now the conversation is not, what's the feature that you're gonna do? It really is starting with, what was the product strategy? What behavior change do we wanna see in our customer base? How are we gonna measure that in the frame of key results? So in this case, some proxy metric that let's say, if you're talking about content streaming and consumption within the first 30 days, we want X human to watch our content a minimum of 15 minutes. Now you have an outcome that people can see that totally ties in with your product strategy and it changes the dynamic of your, your conversations. And you start thinking about your customer base, what you want them to do and how it benefits them and how you're gonna measure for those things. And then your features then are filtered based on that concept. And so there are some people like Alan Kelly, who I talked to, who's been a long time uh, agileist. And he was like, I give you permission to nuke your backlog every quarter. Like he went that severe. I was like, whoa. And, but it's interesting because then you start culling your backlogs, you start having your retrospectives more outcome oriented and, and you're tying in your projects and thinking about is whatever I'm gonna work on next serving what we're trying to accomplish as stated in our objectives and key results. So the conversation is fluid and you're able to then talk to other business leaders about the impact of your work and able to demonstrate its value across departments beyond that. And that's really good for, for teams that have to deal with, you know, getting funding, for example, for why are you investing in fill in the blank teams? Then you're not like, let's shut down these projects. And everyone's like, why? Well, no, like this was our strategy. This team was successful. We're gonna invest in that some more. This team, not so much. Are we gonna pivot? What do we do next? So in, in the sense, I, I feel that OKR should be always transparent to every team. Absolutely. As, yeah, as so they can adjust their backlog, and especially to product owners, so he can always have the why. He should uh, always have the why, and he will have yeah. it, and he will have measures. Uh, he can advance those over time, and you could start blending that kind of conversation in with your regular retrospectives if you want or definitely more broadly, if you have like a superset of retrospectives that you hold at, you know, longer intervals, that's when you should be thinking about it. Great. For sure. Uh, thank you. So there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so Boris asks, uh, what are pros and cons of using OKR uh, methodology in 
agile environment from your point of view? I mean, the pros are you have a common language, right? Some we talk about this if you're doing like BDD or TDD and all that sort of stuff, and that's cool. Um, basically, you're trying to define a broader conversation uh, between the business units as well as the development units. It's just a different way to think about it. Uh, and the ability now to have a common point of view around your contribution to the strategy is also awesome. And in an agile environment where, you know, honestly, if you're able to provide meaningful results, you'll see those teams get better funding or some members of those teams will advance in their careers as a result. I mean, there's lots of pros of being able to do OKR as well from an individual's perspective, a team's perspective, arguably a department's perspective to continue doing the business they're doing and more of it, right? Now, cons of using this in an environment. If what you're talking about is an agile environment where I'm gonna use you know, kind of terminology I'm stealing, like corporate agile, where you're pretending to be agile, you're using the terminology, but really it's waterfall that's painted up to be differently. This is not going to work for you. Um, and I've seen that happen in organizations where now it's become a micromanagement exercise and teams actually don't have the autonomy and freedom to do what they think is the right thing to do because they just don't have the culture or the environment that could support it. And so there, that can go very badly, I think. Um, so I see lots of, of pros and the cons, not so much, unless, again, you kind of fall into those pitfalls. Uh, but if you are really going after agile in the way that kind of everybody ideally thinks about, then this methodology will serve you to, like I mentioned, it will help your customer, it will help your business, it will help you get more funding. And as an individual, if you're able to drive that change, you'll be able to advance your careers as a result, because now your leadership will say, wow, this person's a real strategic thinker. Look at how they advanced our strategy and the measurable results they were able to demonstrate. Boom. There you go. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Uh, the, the pitfall of agile not being agile is something we are all familiar with it's <laughs> in painful. one way or another. Yeah. Painful, painful to watch. Uh, okay. So next question, uh, Stefan asks, any tips, comments on how to sync the portfolio management process uh, budgeting and OKRs uh, and blend them together? Oh, <laughs> um, okay. So tip number one. Because uh, this is this is a huge topic right now, right? Is PPM, right? Portfolio project management and OKRs. First tip is, you know, have the leaders come together. They have to get alignment. And that's not your job per se. Maybe it is your job. If it's your job or you have influence there, have the leadership come together. Discuss what the strategy is across the business. Where I see this not work out is the product team has a strategy, but maybe they're not aligned with their counterparts on the go-to-market teams. And then it gets really ugly. And then CFO is like, what the crap is going on up there? And why is this disjointed? And the overall customer journey is jacked up. Good job, team. Like have them together, right? And then the other thing is think through the major strategic imperatives that the business is trying to achieve, right? And then you should have top line goals that everyone can align behind. And then think about the portfolio investments that you're going to make in the same way your product and you know, your uh, product owners with the engineering teams and designers are thinking through like, what are we going to attack next? And let's look at the backlog with that lens. The portfolio level should also be thinking about it at the portfolio level. What are we trying to achieve and what parts of the portfolio investments are we going to make that can support our end goals? And it should be treated as a hypothesis. We don't know if it's going to work. I guess that's the other comment I would make. We don't know if these investments are going to work. And so at every level of the business, include the highest level, we should have some degree of confidence that we should make that investment and should have conversations with maybe the the people who hold the money, the people who talk about the resourcing so that we can get alignment around this is what we expect to achieve. We're going to give ourselves X amount of time to figure that out. Maybe quarterly buckets, the portfolio investments we're going to make in the next six months is this. Here's the checkpoint that we're going to have kind of, you know, after a quarter and see if we should invest further or not. Like I can't even tell you how many times that kind of exercise doesn't happen and doesn't get orchestrated and people just have their projects and just canceled and they're like, well, why? What are we supposed to do now? 
<laughs> and it's super frustrating, right? And it really yeah. should start with leadership. And then after that, they really should have conversation and context setting with the team so that they are able to actually drive to those outcomes. But they can't know if there's no context or no alignment with leadership. Yeah. So uh, I think you already kind of lead, lead on to this follow-up question. Uh, what would be the, the best way to execute leadership enab- enablement? One-time trainings prove to be effective for us and one-on-one approach is not feasible. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, there's different ways to attack this. Like our, our customers uh, greatly benefit from having uh, kind of workshop sessions with maybe an external Um, Or it could be an advisor to your company. I don't know. Uh, But having executive leadership come together at some regular clip, like annually, biannually, and sit for just a week to think through where they're going to direct the rest of the team. The more I've become, uh, I guess I've advanced in my career, the more that I realized the reason why executive leaders are so freaking tired is because they are being paid to make really good decisions. And the amount of decision influence they have in order to unravel what they just decided could take months to years. Like if you're an engineer and an IC, you made a decision, you committed some code, you probably can revert it in the next minute, right? Executives need to make the time to actually work together to discuss across teams what they're trying to accomplish how they're going to communicate that to everybody. And if that's like a strategy week, go do a strategy week, have a coach come in there, have somebody be able to kind of hold you to account to create the scaffolding for the rest of the organization to be directed towards. Like that is paramount. And I just, I can't accept the excuse of we don't have time. I'm like, you hired a bunch of smart people. How are you going to get them to do what you hired them to do if you don't have the direction to lead them. That's like literally your job is to direct the rest of the organization. So if one-time trainings aren't working, then don't do the training, do more of a workshop. It, it should be a conversation among you and your peer group. One-on-ones won't work because now you have basically siloed yourselves at the beginning. <laughs> don't, don't try that. I wouldn't recommend it. So have them come together. Uh, nice. I like I like the workshop idea. I'm always keen to keen to workshops. So yeah, me uh, too. Yeah. The the next question is kind of uh kind of about that, but uh, also like if we want to move from KPI to OKR, uh, any tips or examples how to get a buy-in uh strategy to sell to leadership this idea, this new methodology that maybe they are not so keen to to do. Right. So in my worldview, like there, there are a lot of differences. Happy to talk about this as well. Um, KPIs are inherently a, like siloed in themselves. They're tracked for a specific department and they're often tracked uh, around just maintenance and the health of whatever processes are already in place. Oh, so it really is about the rear view mirror, if you're using a car analogy. OKRs are really thinking about the future. And if you want to not be blockbuster, if you follow the Netflix, you know, and then the video DVD VHS, if you're that older, like me, where you used to be able to rent these things, right? If you follow that story, then you realize that blockbuster was trying to protect what they had. And Netflix was like, what is the new thing? Like, how do we innovate? And that's the Delta. If you're a business that needs to protect your space, KPIs are great, but they work together. Like KPIs tell you you're doing fine. OKRs tell us what's next and how do we demonstrate progress against that growth? And so it's not a, do we do KPIs or OKRs? It's how do we make them work together? Because if you actually invested in OKRs and you did it correctly, then you're going to not correctly, I would say you're doing it to some degree of like competency, then you'll end up in a situation where your bottom line impacts will be demonstrated. Like you're gonna actually see growth in terms of your revenue, your customer base, your sales, renewals, whatever. Like that's the point. Uh, And those are KPIs, obviously senior executives like to, to measure. 
So the idea is like, do you like growing a business? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yours for you. <laughs> okay. Yours for everybody. Right? Like I said. Uh, nice. Yeah. So I, I like the, the looking the back to, to the future analogy. It's, it seems powerful to me. So uh, the next question, I guess we already mentioned that in the presentation, like uh, how, how could we have some measure of the effects of implementation of OKRs? So we know that they should be in quantitative manner, but I guess the Stefan is asking, how do we know if implementation of OKR methodology worked in some tangible way? Right. So we have our, our customers actually have OKRs around OKRs. It gets really recursive. <laughs> Um, using nerdy language. Um, yeah. Uh, and so you can set an OKR around the efficacy, because if that's your goal, your goal is to successfully adopt and implement OKRs as an organization. Actually, if you go shameless plug, because I represent GTM Hub, you can go to our website, you can find OKRs about OKRs, how to kill it with OKRs, even is one of the objectives, and it provides key results for that, and you can just track and measure against it. Um, uh, fun fact, uh, GTM Hub used that very OKR to help measure the success of our adoption and implementation. Basically, you know, what everyone talks about drinking your own Kool Aid or eating your own dog food, or for the people who like to be a little snazzy, drinking your own champagne. Um, <laughs> we did that. And so set an OKR on OKR and you kind of solved it. Nice. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, okay, so Anna is asking, uh, what would be the best best way to scale distribute companies OKR OKRs across the company? I would say organically is always best, right? And the, usually the way that we see it work out is take your strongest team. Like you already know that this team is delivering, um, and they're delivering value, and they know that. But they are really ambitious, right? Give them the opportunity to try OKRs. And what gets really interesting is other teams, and we've seen this happen. It's like a social experiment we didn't expect. Other teams are like, what are they doing? And why is it working? So in, in what way do you think we should, like if we should give the team an autonomy to set their own OKRs or should we, uh, how, how does that work? So Andy Grove wrote this beautiful book called High Output Management. He talks about different layers of uh, task maturity. Now, this is not a task per se. I guess it kind of is, but it really depends. I know that's a horrible answer. It depends on the ability for the team to think autonomously, right? If the team is like, well, I don't know what the crap we're supposed to go do, then the leader should come up and say, here are some options for objectives that maybe you want to cover. And then the team maybe collaborates with that leader to think through key results. And you know, they negotiate what the appropriate levels of measurements are. Because let's face it, executives are like, I want a bajillion of these things. And the team's like, we can only do 1% of that. Are you for real right now? And so that negotiation should happen. Um, and, and that's a way to do it. it. That's kind of the middle ground. In some instances, especially if OKR uh, development is kind of immature in the organization, again, that's why I suggest you take your strongest team because they'll sort it out. But if it's, you're not starting there, then senior leadership should take a, a stronger stance on helping that team or that department set their objectives and key results and to set those expectations up front. And then kind of an analogy I use is kind of like you're riding a bike. Maybe you're American, you put training wheels on. If you're in Germany, you just start them young and you just put them on a balanced bike. Apparently that's very European. So think about it that way. It's like, are they, you know, how hard are they going to fall? Like a two-year-old's not going to fall very far to the ground. So you can give them the bike without the training wheels. It's fine. Just let them go. Be autonomous, figure it out. But here's the key. You hold them accountable, and if they were to succeed, then obviously you would reward and recognize their achievement. If they don't, you still reward and recognize them for having tried, especially if tried to push themselves outside of the current comfort zone, because you're asking them to do something that they don't have a competency in yet. And so I think both need to be celebrated. That's the key. That's really the key. Great. That's, that's great advice. So uh, when we are talking about this, before I go on to other questions, I just, I just have a follow-up question because we are already at this uh, topic so when you when you're talking about one team we actually talking about some bottom-up mm -hmm. approach and what's the difference maybe just a few few key differences and examples of uh, top-down and bottom-up approach in implementation of okrs right so top-down is command and control like old school style i tell you what to do this is what you're going to do it go 
right? And a lot of us have heard that and we're like, some people are comfortable in that environment. That's fine. Bottom up, it's like, let's do whatever it is that we think is the right thing to do. Um, challenge with that is though, you have no orientation of what the right thing is to do because you don't have leadership that's pointing in the direction. So the ideal scenario is when senior leadership's like, here are kind of the top level objectives. If you're Atlassian, if you watched Atlassian at all, one of their objectives is to be cloud first by a certain time. You would probably notice in their marketing, they were like, we are now you know, kind of deprecating our on-prem solutions. And everyone's like, oh, wow. Now their teams know that context. And when they're building out and making investments about what they're going to do next, they're considering cloud first options because that's the guidance. And so that's the ideal scenario, top down and bottom up, if that makes sense. So command and control, this generation, I don't think deals with that too well anymore. Just maybe some people, but very few bottom up. Not great either because then you're directionless and every team's out for themselves and that's not great. Ideally top down, bottom up where leadership's like, this is directionally where we should go, cloud first by set date. And the teams are like, got it boss, let's go. And then they figure yeah. out how they're gonna accommodate that. That's Yeah, they have be. the autonomy to, to figure out- To make the decisions. Their... Yeah, yeah that's, that. I, uh, I agree totally. Uh, okay, so we have a comment from uh, Ivan. Portfolio management versus OKRs. Is it like uh, OKRs define the goal and tell us if we got there, but they don't tell us how to get there? Portfolio management uh, handles our hypothesis, our bets on getting to the O defined by KRs. That's Can beautiful. Can we look at like this? Yes, 100% yes. So like you define your goal, you measure the outcomes you want to achieve. Your portfolio tells you what exactly you're going to invest in to get to that outcome. Uh, and then you bake your bets. You're like, okay, we, we thought that if we built out functionality capabilities X, Y, Z, it was going to, I don't know, uh, attract a new market and 12% net new customers this quarter. Great. Did you actually achieve it? Did the things that you develop actually provide that outcome for the business? The portfolio investments did you make? Were they worth it? Like, that's what you're asking yourself. So, Yvonne, I think that's absolutely the way to think about it. 100%. Nice. Uh, okay, so another question from Anna for the product company. How do OKRs work with feature-based roadmap? Oh God, that's the worst. <laughs> they don't. I think. I mean, it depends. I know like, that's why I'm asking. Like, I don't think they work. Like, I don't think you should say, "Here's feature X, Y, Z, and here's what the result should be as a result of whatever that is." It's backwards. I think. Um, and what you end up, and that's this, that's what I was talking about earlier about corporate agile. That's corporate agile. Like one of its, you know, marquee things is the feature factory. We talk about that. And what we're seeing now more and more is this transition from project-based development to product-based development. And the one of the key thoughts behind that is the team should be free to say this feature doesn't make sense anymore. Because either the market's not adopting it, we're not seeing a change in behavior from our customers, and it doesn't align with our overall objectives as a, as a team, a business unit, whatever. And so everything should really lean into what is the, the overall outcome, the goal we want to achieve, and then how do we use our roadmap informed by that goal setting methodology, whatever it might be. Like that is... The, the levels. Otherwise, you're really, it's square peg, round hole analogy. If you're an American, it just doesn't fit because you're trying to force the feature thing that you've got into an outcome-based tool when you don't even know. You have a presupposition. And that's, that's where I think product gets elevated is that you're able to challenge the assumptions of what you even thought would solve the problem for the customer when you look at the outcomes. You look at the, you look at your backlog, your feature list, whatever it is, wherever you might keep and you're like, does this still make sense? You should have the authority and the, the, the deliberate ability to make, to ask that question and to answer it for yourselves at some regular cadence. So that's why I suggest you don't start with, here's the roadmap, how do OKRs fit? You should start with what are OKRs? How does the roadmap fit? It provides that level of questioning and it elevates the conversation for teams to be much more innovative about their approach. Because what if like a new 
fill in the blank technology and bleeding edge came out and the teams are like, you know what, that would make a lot more sense here than whatever we were planning on doing. Or we saw this market shift over there and that competency it was already built in with a different product. Why don't we just integrate? Or we might buy it as a business, that capability, rather than build it. Because that's a decision businesses often make is the buy versus build, right? Uh, yeah, so the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, have you seen that teams use uh, the CFRs in some structured manner to follow the OKR framework? And how does it look like? I mean, it depends. Like I've heard it in pieces, actually, a company we acquired, you buy or build competencies, we bought uh, to cover our um, kind of teams, small to medium-sized businesses, mid-market. Like, so Koan is now our offering to the market for those customers looking for that. CFRs are loosely in that framework. So CFRs, for those who don't know, are conversations, feedback, and recognition. Um, I've seen businesses do it in all kinds of manners, so I don't know if there is any hard and fast rule, but the key concepts are you should be having conversations around your OKRs at some regular clip. This works really beautifully with scrum teams in particular because they're custom to cadence. Then feedback should be something that honestly isn't coming from team leads or managers to the team, but the team to each other. Like that's when I see it happen best. It's like some peer or somebody who you highly respect and trust is like, Hey, feedback for the thing that I saw that you made, not so great, or feedback for this thing that you made really amazing. And here's why our customers were raving about it. And I saw them use it. It's awesome. Good job. Feedback should not be some, you know, magnanimous event. And then recognition. I mean, that's something that should be standardized. And I have seen Lean Plum. I don't know if you all are familiar with them. They came out of Bulgaria. They're an amazing team. Uh, they did something where for OKRs as part of their recognition, they had corporately assigned budget around recognition between teams to identify who was the team that really crushed their objective and key result in two ways. Either they over exceeded expectation, exceeded or over exceeded expectations around that goal, or they learned a crazy amount. And the teams that they really respected were able to submit who they thought should win. And then the winning team, you know, got some sort of monetary uh, award, like as a collective uh, to do whatever. What they found was really fascinating is sometimes the teams forgot to spend that money because they were so excited to be recognized by the team. Like, because that's what a lot of people say, like, I joined this company because I love the vision and I really like this team. That's why I stayed. And can you imagine if somebody that you highly, you know, let's say like your scrum team 12, whatever it might be. And they tell scrum team two, we think you're the winner and here's why. Like they're gonna feel pretty good about that. And that's yep. recognition that goes a really long way. And that could be elevated at the corporate level and, and funded. So I've seen it done myriad of ways, but those are the key concepts behind it. Okay, uh, cool, thanks. Uh, so uh, Anna is also asking how granular do OKRs go? Should it be, should, could, could they be used for personal purpose or goals or is the team the smallest organization part to apply it to? I mean, this is a really, really great, great question, I think. Um, I tend to be very pragmatic. Uh, and so I, and, and I tend not to be dogmatic. I hate dogmatism, I think it's nuts. Uh, in the corporate setting, however, I think that it, it does not work to have OKRs go down to the personal level like in the business setting. And here's why. Um, the whole point of OKRs is to get, and here's the thing about enterprise. And this, I learned this when I, we got acquired by Microsoft. The reason why you start building teams and teams of teams that become departments and then departments together to define groups and so on and so forth is because you have a bunch of really smart people who could do more better together. And if you start to incentivize people to attack personal goals and to hold them accountable to those OKRs at a personal level, then you're counteracting the effects that you get from people working together. And so I'm a massive advocate for team-based OKRs. Now, in a private setting, absolutely, you can use personal OKRs to advance whatever it is you're trying to do. I actually had an OKR, personal OKR that I called Jenny Bring Sexy Back. Yes, Justin Timberlake, yes, I did it. 
And I thought that if I was able to be at peace with myself, so meditation, like I track meditation time, um, workout time for my physical health, uh, sleep time, because I think if you sleep a certain amount, that helps your prettiness, your sexiness level, and the amount that I read, um, just to elevate my thinking and the amount of time or the, the different content I would consume. I listen to podcasts. All of these things together help Jenny bring sexy back, in my opinion, by my definition. Work for me like a charm. Um, I felt really powerful at the end of this. But corporately, I'm a massive advocate for team. Yeah, I, I would draw a connection here between like, I have a scrum board with my team, but I also have scrum board for my personal, uh, not in <laughs> office hours time. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the pretty much the same basic point you can apply it to your like personal goals but there is in organization there is something when you put a team together on one board or or on the same okrs that happen mm -hmm. uh, okay cool uh so we're just having some hearts here and some uh very interesting uh, webinar kind of uh, <laughs> blessings from the audience thank you very much i imagine it's because of me uh not our awesome <laughs> not our uh, awesome host uh okay uh guest yeah so uh the uh the anna is asking for everyone tip follow tim herbig yeah he's really yeah. great i like okay. tim's work he's got some good stuff definitely check him out the other person if you probably have um jeff got health he's based i think somewhere in southern europe uh, but he has like a, a scrum uh, certification course, but he writes a lot about OKRs these days. So he would be another one I would suggest following on this topic. Nice. Uh, so yeah, they also, uh, Anna finishes with a question. What do you think about this uh, setup where the company is using the same objective, but define KR per team to contribute today to, to the same OKR? I think that's a great setup. I think uh, that's a, a wonderful way to align because if everyone has the idea of where you need to go, but everyone has the ability to define how they're going to call success and contribution to that, I think you could force some really wonderful conversations and alignment around what the, the team department uh, organization is trying to achieve all up. So we've actually seen that happen. We, we model that in GTM Hub as a use case. And we do see customers uh, go that route, especially for like the really broad company objectives where cloud first 2024 Atlassian is a thing. How is everyone can contribute key results uh, with their particular discipline or teams uh, to be able to achieve that end? So we, we see that actually pattern. One of my friends works as a VP over at Atlassian and she's like, that's how we do it. So good idea. Yeah, uh, so Dan is asking best practices on how to deal with uh, overlapping KRs across teams. Collaborate. <laughs> Bam. right there it's right there in the open day right uh, sorry the open. <laughs> like i think i think you should probably reach out to those individuals and ask the question how should we work together to achieve these key results um and how do we keep each other involved involved and informed of our progress as we as we progress again the beautiful thing about enterprises or departments or groups or teams that you're able to do more amazing things together. Imagine if you have those brains together thinking through achieving and defining success criteria together and like what investments you're going to make on the project portfolio program front. It gets to be pretty magical. So shared OKRs for the win in some instances. Collaborate. Cool. Uh, so there are no more questions at this minute. We still have some time. So guys, feel free if you have any. any oh, here is one. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, Thank you. Uh, do you have uh, do you have advice where we could see successful implementation of OKRs? Do you know that some uh, do you know that somebody shared and described details in OKRs with the public? Uh, yeah. So GitLab for sure actually writes down what uh, they're doing. I think in public forum. Um, I think Travel Perk also has documented how they do it. So there are a lot of scale ups and startups that have documented. Uh, their OKRs and publish them. So happy to connect with you also, if you wanna uh, hit me up, I'll share my contact details at the end of this thing. Um, do I have any advice on where we could see that? I mean, 
Google searching for sure, but GTM Hub also has some case studies if you're interested in seeing what it looks like with a solution like ours and how to use technology to advance that, because obviously this is what we do for a living. So happy to connect and, and share whatever knowledge I can to, yeah, to assist you all. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, great. Uh, okay, so we still have around 10 minutes. I don't know if you have any additional uh, thoughts, Jenny, or like something that popped up during these questions for you to share. Um, maybe we can start to call through some of the questions that we had shared in advance. Well, no, there's more questions. Nope. That's good. Okay. No. Yeah. I... As we work. Okay. <laughs> I was How just much... scrolling through them. Like we already <laughs> covered uh, some of them, like most of them, I think. But uh, yeah, there are still some. Uh, but I was asking how much the company needs to be open to experiments to be able to do OKR successfully. I think that, she, I mean, you have to have a, here's the, the key. It's, it's not, I think the question is not even about experimentation, although I understand what you're getting at. It really is, what is the appetite for potential failure? Like, that's the real question. Uh, and I found that organizations that, uh, and that's where KPIs get really interesting to me when we have that conversation. It's like people get fired over KPIs not getting hit, right? Like they're gone because they weren't able to hit their target or whatever, especially, right? Frightening. Now, if your organization is that mindset and you're trying to say, let's do OKRs, but you still have that mindset, if you don't hit it, you're dead. Like, it's not gonna work out because people will not want to stretch. They will not want to experiment. They will not, because they, the, something's on the line, like their, their reputation, their career could be on the line for this. And so for sure, the organization needs to be open to, for experimentation. And the further question is they definitely need to be open for the potential outcome being we did not achieve our slated objective. And that is okay. Now, then what should happen is a change in mindset among leaders, mid-management, people who are on the teams and individual contributors to think through, did we learn? Are we applying that learning moving forward? Is it helping us to deliver better benefits or outcomes to the customer or to the business? If the answer is, yeah, because our processes are better or we, we're documenting our data like we've never before. We're actually using data to make better decisions, insightful decisions, cool. Um, yeah, so should you be open to experimentation? Yes. Should you be open for the possibility that your hypothesis might fail? Yes. Should you also then think on the opposite of that? What's the opposite of failure? Lots of learning. People who have really, really rocked their careers and been successful in business or whatever, they have stories to tell about how many times they have failed. And that's this at scale. A bunch of people trying things they've never tried before to see if it'll work. And if it works, good for you. And if it doesn't, we're gonna apply that learning moving forward because that'll make us better. Great. Uh, so we have a question about uh, OKRs getting in popularity and where do you see them five years from now? But I would like to start this question with maybe to tell, to, for you to tell us when did you fell in love with OKR methodology and where did you first had a contact with it? Oh, gosh. I mean, I've been with GTM Hub. I'm, I was employee number 20. Uh, I fell in love with it when I met this team, actually, they introduced me to the concept. They were in the uh, Techstars Accelerator Program 2017. I met the founding team. We didn't connect again until 2018. I met the CEO here in Berlin. That's where I live and I'm based. Uh, and Yvonne was like, I wanna do this. And I was like, I do too, how can I help? And he was like, why don't you join the team? And I've been there since like, seriously, under employee 30, for sure. I think around employee 20, we didn't even have an HR system. So we know what employee count we were. It was an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. And I don't even know where that Excel spreadsheet is anymore. So we have no idea what number I am, but we're now over 300. And by end of year, we will be over five, 600. Um, so my love for this has been long before I think I joined this team because I, I really, get excited about people being given the tools to do what they think is the right thing to do and then to be able to demonstrate unequivocally that what they had to say mattered and i think okr is when used in the appropriate ways uh, enable people to have those conversations and i mean i can't even tell you how many 
uh, promotion, you know, benefit, like bonus conversations where it's just like, well, if that person obviously has you in their good graces, like, why are they getting performance increases? And this person over here is killing it. We don't have a common language around success. It's not cool. Um, and now I feel like this is a conversation where it's like, well, no, the team succeeded or they learned a lot. How do we reward them and the behaviors around just acting rightly? Like that should be rewarded. And I, I'd love that. And I will probably be, yeah, that's why I'm the evangelist for the company, if you can't tell. I've loved it forever. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. And regarding the getting popularity, uh, how do you see that? And where do you see uh, OKRs five years from now? I think this is going to be a very important part of business in the same way we saw agile transformations, like for a long time, this started with tech, right? Everybody was like agile transformation, agility. And now you're seeing people talk about how do you apply agile mindset to design? How do you adapt uh, agility to the marketing function, to all the other functions in the same way we saw that happen among our community? We will see this happen, uh, I think, with OKRs for a pretty long time. Um, will it evolve? Perhaps, but the foundations will still hold true. What do we want to achieve? How are we going to call success via quantitative measures? And why the heck are we doing this at all? Those three foundational questions should be answered anyway. Great. Uh, so Anna has a, a tough one. Uh, what happens in a product organizations where the sales have their KPIs, and but product team is using OKRs? I mean, we've heard this a, a lot before as well. Uh, our sales team does have uh, OKRs and KPIs. They can work well together, uh, but it doesn't need to be forced. Ooh, I can't believe this is being recorded, right? Uh, Jenny, how, can you, how dare you? Again, it's the pragmatic approach. Like if KPIs are working for the sales team and they have their targets, like what kind of in innovation do you really <laughs> need to see you want them to close you want close one deals you want them to be able to call a bunch of people and get people into the pipeline get them through the conversion sales stages like they know what they need to do and their compensation is tied to that if it's working why mess with it but there are sales organizations that do use okrs now how Imagine a universe where you're starting to tie OKRs around reselling and the retention of your customer base, because there might be conflicts there where your sales organization is like, sell, 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 but they're selling to the wrong customers. They're churning. Well, how do you fix that problem? Well, you could say OKRs for now, they need to be blended and you have to think about interesting incentivization schemas so you don't, you know demoralize them because they often get paid very well, but that help bring them back to the rest of the organization where they're maybe working more tightly with customer success managers for the retention of those accounts. They're working with product because they're, they need to bring the product feedback um, so that they can, you know, retain those customers because retention is a really strong indicator for growth. We know that it's probably your best growth engine um, because there's only so many customers in the world and so many people you can acquire. And if you bleed them out and churn them, that's not great. So there is a case for that. Um, but it depends on the organization and how you want to incentivize people to behave. Uh, and there is a case where you might have KPIs for sales, which we do, and OKRs for sales, which we also do at GTM Hub and several of our customers as well. So we've seen a case for the blend. Nice. Cool. Uh, so... We have some questions about recording. It will be it will be available and it will be sent to everybody uh, via email. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe even a last question uh, if we <laughs> we are running out of time. Uh, so yeah, uh, we also have some kind words for our Jenny here. Uh, so what could be like some example of uh, OKR in uh, let's say IT industry? Like example of some OKR for that kind of companies? Oh gosh, IT is such a broad blanket term. Let's say um, right at the, one of the big ones, for example, right now is around security, right? Uh, like especially cybersecurity because ransomware is legit and all kinds of stuff. And you need to make sure that your systems are, are doing whatever they need to do. So I can imagine it's like, you know, our objective is our systems are secure. Cool. And then you can have key results around like 
we're going to patch systems within, you know, seven, 14 days or number two, like um, we're going to uh, get ISO 27001 certified or whatever it is. We're going to do X amount of penetration tests at a regular frequency or, you know, like whatever it is, there are different ways to think through. Like if we do these things, we for sure know that our system is secure. Mind you, some of those things that I listed out are more tasks and that's horrible, but you get the gist. Okay, uh, cool. So we are at uh, one minute from our time box. And if Scrum Masters hate anything, that's breaking time box. So <laughs> I think- Can I throw one slide up? Um, this is <laughs> yeah, my info course. so that you can see. Uh, yeah, you can hit me up. So I'm at Tujing on Twitter's. Uh, Jenny Harold on LinkedIn. You can hit me up at Jenny at gtmhub.com. You can check out our podcast on gtmhub.com radio. We also uh, have just bought Koan, so you can check them out as well. And this will be recorded so you can see that later. Uh, yeah, so that's my info. Hit me up. If you want examples about OKRs, you can also find those at gtmhub.com. We have templates galore about how to, yeah, it's called Microplace. It's marketplace.gtmhub.com. We have all this stuff, lots of collateral. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. I, I really enjoyed our time here and it was super useful to cool. me and I hope for our uh, guys in a, in a chat and in the audience, the silent ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, here are some kind words from our you. Uh, audience. You all were uh, awesome. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and I hope we'll work together or maybe some other meetup or who knows, maybe some on some other stuff yeah great super fun yeah uh so that's it from us guys uh, see you on other uh serving product community meetup or scrum wednesday meetup uh jenny you are welcome anytime thanks a lot mario thanks anna for the invite <laughs> talk soon bye bye guys <laughs>